Welcome to The Near Memo, a weekly conversation about search, social, and commerce. What happened, why it matters, and the implications for local. Welcome back to The Near Memo with David, Mike, and me. And we're, as always, here to talk about the week in search, social, and commerce. Um, And as usual, there's more news than we can fully discuss in our 25-ish minutes, um, but we're going to do our best. This week is kind of uh, the theme is reviews and some of the activity that's been going on at the FTC. Uh, Google and Yelp had news around reviews this week, and the FTC did uh, did some important... Uh, we actually covered this week stuff that happened before around the, the fine with uh, Fashion Nova, the review guidance, and then, of course, the notification of the 10 review platforms, and we'll get into that in a second. But first up, because it's such a big deal, we have to talk a little bit about what happened with Facebook and its earnings and its its uh, kind of stock uh, wipeout. I don't know where it is this morning, but they lost something like $240 billion in uh, in market cap value yesterday, which somebody pointed out on Twitter, uh, David, I think you were the one that, that flagged this, that this is more that they lost in one day than most companies have ever been worth, you know, in the, it's sort of the zenith of their valuations, which is really an astounding thing. And uh, Zuckerberg's personal losses were pretty astounding in terms of billions of dollars in net worth, but he's still worth something like 90 billion or whatever it is. Not It's just funny money. I'd like to, <laughs> I'd like to be worth a tiny little fraction of that. <laughs> um, anyway, so, so what is your, what is your take on the question of whether or not, um, you know, they, they lost users for the first time. They're struggling. They, they claim that Apple is going to cost them $10 billion uh, this year, the privacy uh, changes that Apple instituted in, in uh, iOS 14.5 and beyond. Um, is, this, is this a temporary thing? Is this a dip, uh, an, an investor opportunity, in other words? Or is this uh, s- signify the cumulative impact of all that has come before and they're really starting to flatline in this in this country and that growth is going to be elusive for them going forward. What do you guys think about that? Yeah, I would, as we were saying in the in the green room before, uh, I w- will not be buying on the dip for ethical reasons, just because I don't want to support uh, Facebook as a company. But I don't really see this um, current frenzy over the whether it's the Apple privacy loss uh, that Facebook is projecting or the drop in users, I I don't see as kind of an existential threat to them. Um, The reality is that most of their growth opportunity is actually still in developing world countries. Um, And I haven't I haven't seen any data that they're losing users over there or that engagements dropping over there. They still own WhatsApp, which is a huge installed user base that I don't see going away that they've barely monetized, if at all. So, I mean, I think there's still plenty like I happen to be I happen to think the metaverse as a concept is stupid and even stupider in Facebook's execution of it, you know, whatever, we'll see kind of where that goes. But I, I actually see their sort of next five year horizon as still pretty strong, unless there's like a major antitrust thing that comes out. But I think it's, a, this is kind of a typical overreaction, everybody piling on, um, you know, I'm happy to see it, frankly, but um, I don't, I don't think it's going to be a long term impact for them. So. Well, invest, investors are very nervous, right? It's the market is volatile. People are very skittish. And I think part of the reaction was the surprise versus Google, Microsoft, Apple results, yeah. right? So everybody was doing really well and their peers kind of outperformed for the most part. And Facebook came along and, you know, I think beat revenue expectations, but law, uh, but but on the bottom line, they, they missed. And then all the user stuff. So People people were were surprised by that. That took them by surprise, and I think that that exaggerated the impact. Perhaps I, I would tend to agree with you, although I do think that some of what has come before the the bad behavior that we've talked about many times is having an in, in impact on user engagement and user growth, at least in the United States. I don't know, Mike, if you have I, any. You know, I I sort of I have a that. history of ignoring Facebook. I'm happy I have. <laughs> I just don't engage with them much. It's like, I, I don't understand their. You know, they. I don't understand why they get in this blame game, right? It's Apple's fault and small businesses suffer. It's just bullshit, right? They've got a huge user base. 
They have a huge marketing engine. They have a huge advertising capability. And they have the ability to switch from behavioral to contextual if they want to. They know they can see what people are reading. They understand it. They can create different advertising models. So I, I, I just see their sort of hand wringing as uh, the boy crying wolf. And I typically tend, I just tend to ignore it. So, and I'm going to continue to ignore it. I, I don't <laughs> see, I have no place in my life. I'm with David. I think their idea of the metaverse is like, I, have no interest in going there. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a separate conversation. I mean, I think it's I think I think it's interesting, and I think it'll show up in ways that are different than what people expect. But that's you know I, I, they may have some challenges there. Um, well, I mean, it, it is great, true don't... that they don't control the platforms that they depend on. Right? They don't control Android. They don't control iPhone, <clears throat> and they are very dependent on them. And that's true. And I, this is one aspect of sort of the sumo wrestlers at the top going up against each other, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, Google. Those, those companies only have each other to compete with. They're so far out ahead of everybody else. And in that mix, I see Facebook as the most vulnerable because they control so little of their own future in that regard, which is why the metaverse is so important to them, but also why they're vulnerable to what should be reasonable privacy actions on the part of Apple perceived as, uh, and which I cannot for the life of me understand how this is negative to small business, but they keep making that claim. Well, I mean, I mean, I understand why they make that argument, but in fact, um, you know, it's, what's fascinating is that as we've discussed before, Small businesses have embraced Facebook more than they've seen. And Instagram Google, even right? more, in my opinion. I think, I, I mean, yeah. I don't, yeah. the number of businesses who are, you know, posting menus and everything else exclusively on Instagram and nowhere else, I think is that that wave is higher than the wave of just posting to Facebook in 2010 or whenever that peak was. It's, so, well, it's simpler, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. it's simpler. Instagram is an easier platform even yeah. than Facebook. But it's but it's really striking to me how Google has invested. I mean, I don't want to get us too off course on this, but Google has invested so many resources over the last two decades in acquiring small business customers, um, and even for something as kind of self evidently valuable as GMB, GBP, and they have only had mixed results. Whereas Facebook has arguably done less in terms of partnerships and marketing, and they've had much greater success. Yeah, it easier to product is definitely one. And I also think that the sort of that Google's reluctance to share and reluctance to push just how dominant uh, the Google business profile is in customer acquisition is also a huge hurdle for them. And I don't understand, I don't fully understand the reason for that. But when, well, maybe when you see like on Instagram, that, that might be an you, you post your menu and it gets 500 likes in three hours. I mean, that's an immediate reinforcing signal that Google just has never provided. And I don't know if they will provide. So, well, they're bringing that argument out in their antitrust defense. Small businesses are not going to be as visible mm -hmm. for free on Google. And this is providing the bulk of small business leads. Yeah, well, they are doing it there under duress. Right. But only one forced to it, but it's, it seems to me a massive, you know, product marketing failure on their part. And, um, I think in addition to the much simpler products that Facebook has, you know, that's, that's gotta be a contributing factor. So, um, Greg, I was going to ask one, one question before we move on, um, you know, and back to the metaverse concept. So, I mean, I feel, I feel like we've, we've in some ways seen this movie before where Google re, re constituted itself as alphabet and it has all of these you know, big moonshot bets like fiber and the loon, you know, Waymo, Waymo every, everything else. Yep. And their stock price just keep, you know, kept sort of trucking along because they were making so much money on their number one business of, of ads. Um, and I wonder how much of this is, and I don't think investors ever liked any of those other moonshot projects. They were just willing to subsidize them while Google was still making a bunch of money. So I wonder how much of this is like, a sort of delayed reaction to investors not believing in the long-term vision of the metaverse, but then also coupled with the, you know, the, the Apple announcement and the, the, the loss in ad revenues, whether it's like, okay, well, this company has no long-term future. We hate their long-term vision and they're no longer going to be this cash machine. So we're pulling out. 
I, I think that I think that there's some possible truth to that. I think people probably see the metaverse concept as flimsy. You know, it's 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 kind of embryonic still, and there's no proof there that Facebook is going to have any success, right? And there's, you know, I mean, it's 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 certainly top of mind for a lot of people. It's the it's a buzzword that everybody's talking about with the, you know, Microsoft bought Activision for seventy five billion dollars or whatever it is. You know, obviously they're making a huge bet there and all the VR and AR stuff is top of mind for people. But I think in, in Facebook's case, there's no indication yet that they're going to have any success. So I do think that what you're saying is right, that people are don't have confidence that the long term vision is going to is going to play out. And so th this this suggests, you know, well, this is where the bulk of the revenue is going to come from for the foreseeable future. And if it's flatlining or, or the growth is really moderating, then we want to get out, you know, or we want to hedge or something so but let's let's move on to um the perennial topic of reviews <laughs> that we seem to be per, what's the what's the, uh, the, with the these... version of perennial that is per week not per year <laughs> um per, per weekly, know if there is per one, weekly. we're gonna coin a new one yeah yes the 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 yes um so so we had we had uh information this week from yelp and from Google, Google talking about which we'll get to in a second about how they how they uh, fight review spam, fake reviews, review moderation, and Yelp talking about its own process in a in a sort of a simpler way. And well, what did Yelp say? Yeah, so Yelp released its annual quote trust and safety report end quote uh, for the year, and a couple of interesting sort of nuggets. Um, close to twenty million reviews were contributed to Yelp uh, last year. Um, that was one thing that was interesting. That's like one, one week at Google, uh, right? something close to that. Mike, Mike would be a lot closer <laughs> to that stat than I am, but, um, yeah. So, you know, they, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Well, of course. I, I mean, I think, yeah, there's certainly a, a grain of truth to that, um, to that poking of fun. Yeah. It's, it's like a 10, it's like a 10 X, it's like a yeah. 10 X difference yeah. at Google, something like um, that. Um, yeah. so of those 19.6 million reviews that were contributed, uh, they said, um, Seventy-one percent got through their review filter, and twenty-two percent did not, uh, and six percent were removed uh, for violating other policies um, or by reviewers. So, six percent you can kind of set aside. The twenty-two twenty-two percent of reviews are filtered uh, on Yelp, and that is to me just an astonishingly high number uh, of, of filtered reviews, particularly relevant or relate in relation to the report that you published while you were at Uber all, Greg, with um, the transparency company around the percentage of fraudulent reviews on Google. I don't remember that number being on Google being anything close to 22%. And clearly Google has almost no review moderation in place. So it, it was, it was 10 point, it was 10.7% across 19 categories with a, a total of a million reviews. Looked yeah. At so Google. that to me says Yelp is filtering over 11% of legitimate reviews with its filter, which says to me, you're not presenting a more accurate view of the world on Yelp as Google is presenting. It's just a different view. You're, you're seeing a, um, the, the bell curve of reviews or the, or the bell curve of ratings is probably lower on Yelp because there are, there are positive reviews that are just not getting through that are completely legitimate. And, you know, the, the factors that play into Yelp's filter, are, you know, not that many. And the big one is just casual reviewers who, aren't hardcore Yelpers who are writing eight paragraph tomes of every place they visit. Um, those reviews from average people are just not, not getting through this, this filter. And I think that that's a, it's a pretty disingenuous, um, you know, it's a pretty disingenuous way for Yelp to position this as trust and safety when they're presenting an equally inaccurate uh, picture or, or um, an equally accurate picture as, as Google and other, other search sites. I mean, before you before you jump in, jump in, Mike. Let me just tell 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 people that the the number we found of of, of dubious or suspicious or questionable reviews that were high 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 had a high probability of being spam or fake was seven point one percent for Yelp. A million reviews on Yelp across. So there's still seven percent yeah. of reviews getting through their filter that are fraudulent. Well, unless the um, yes, right. correct. So. Yes. Okay. That, then that, the number of the number of actual that. reviews that are getting through that, or that are getting filtered then is even higher, right? So if there's uh, that that to me is like a you know a, an exclamation point on this statement is that Yelp's filter is 
not very good, and it's filtering out a huge range of legitimate positive reviews. And as a result, they're presenting just as inaccurate, if not a more inaccurate picture of, of what a business experience is than Google. Right. So at gather up, I did do research on the bell curves for a number of review sites and it, and Yelp's bell curve is lower th than Google's and everybody else's. It's one of the lowest. Um, it's a edit, it's a decision on the part of Yelp that serves their interest. It's a way of fight. It's a one way of them fighting spam inexpensively by driving up the cost of leaving spam. One of the easiest ways to leave spam is to create profiles and drop a single review or two reviews on that profile and then move on. It's you can't use that tactic at Yelp, so you ha it's much more expensive for spammers to do it. So the casualty of that is these short these uh, newbies that haven't left any reviews. Also, it serves Yelp's focus on this longer format. Uh, snarky or negative review that they've always highlighted. So there's both an, it serves an editorial view as well as they're cheaper to fight spam the way they're doing it than more sophisticated human curation and or more sophisticated algorithms. Um, and it does, as you said, skew things. And there is some research that shows that not allowing uh, solicitation, which they don't, and the way they moderate skews from reality fair bit. Uh, so you're absolutely right on all those points. And it's just how Yelp rolls though, right? And it is within their purview to make these decisions through Section 230. They can make these editorial decisions any way they yeah. want. And they've done it in a way that antagonizes and alienates businesses from the review world, which forced causes many of these businesses to think they need to do things like review gating review uh, preferencing, Ironically. all that sort of stuff. It, so uh, it's yeah. an interesting dynamic where Yelp and Google's behaviors create some of the features that the FTC is criticizing. Before we make the segue, there's one what? other piece of this. Uh, no, no, not. No, I'm okay. not ready to make the segue. There's one other piece of this report that I found pretty interesting. Um, they, Yelp said that about 1,850 consumer alerts, essentially badges of shame, were placed on Yelp profiles uh, due to these businesses basically soliciting reviews on Yelp, which strikes me as an insanely low percentage of all businesses and probably an insanely low percentage of businesses who are actively soliciting reviews on Yelp, which does violate um, their terms of service. And to me, I, you know, as a small business, if I'm looking at something like 20 million probably businesses, US businesses on Yelp and Yelp is filtering only 2000 or putting a badge of shame on only 2000 of them. That makes me a little more likely, Mike, to actually try some spam, spam by Yelp's definition um, and ask for reviews. It seems like they're not cracking down particularly heavily on you know some of these solicitation efforts if only 2000 badges were placed in the entire year. Certainly some of it's just performance, David, you know that. They, yeah. they, they, they huff and they puff and then they go away. So most review sites, many review sites, stopped listening and Yelp for a while and then started back up again. Yeah. I can attest to that fact. What, what I was going to say to sort of conclude this section is, is that, um, you know, years ago, I mean, Yelp has moved more and more into sort of SaaS services, right? They have RFPs and they have different kinds of services that, that people can, that businesses can subscribe to uh, booking, online booking, that they should use. I, I had this conversation with Luther Lowe, from Yelp maybe a decade ago, maybe, maybe not that long, but um, you know, that they should, they should use those tools and then become a review solicitor themselves. Yes. Right. And it's the same way that Amazon kind of does that. You booked a business, um, you know, how was it uh, rate the re business? I mean, they do the very tepid version of that. If you've checked right. in somewhere, That's they prompt you to yeah. leave a review, but, but, but this, this is a kind of closed loop system that would benefit them in terms of verified purchaser kind of approach and benefit the businesses that are engage that are using these tools because it would encourage them to use the tools. It would be one of the benefits of using the tools and they would get more reviews and the reviews would presumably be legitimate. And it just seems to me to be a yeah. no brainer, but yet they, they, at least in that initial conversation, uh, you know, Luther was quite skeptical that this couldn't also be faked. Somebody could create a face fake booking and then generate reviews and then simply not, 
you know, I don't know. But it, it just it just seems to me that it's a, an obvious thing that they should be yeah, doing. Absolutely. And that the I check-in see, offer thing, you know, that's been around good. and been a been a legitimate uh, recommendation by Yelp that businesses should post a check-in offer and Yelp will follow up to get a review. That's the best way to get reviews on Yelp. That's a that's a white hat best practice, but from a at a sort of macro level, you know, that exacerbates the problem of only showing reviews from hardcore Yelpers if you're limiting the set of reviewers to people who not only have the Yelp app on their phone, but also are active checker inners and even know what that right. means, yeah. which, you know, if you'd said the word check in to my mom, she'd think you were, you know, checking in for a flight or something. Why would I do that at a restaurant? Right. So. Right. Yeah. It'll be interesting to I see agree. what the, their, their quarterly financials are next week. It'll be interesting to see what they report out. Yeah. Thanks for joining David, Mike, and Greg. To stay on top of the latest developments in local, subscribe to our newsletter at nearmedia.co. We'll see you next week.